We're going live. We are live. Hello. Good to go. Good to go. Dr. John is in the house. Hello, EQ Advantage. Um, super excited to be here talking about important issues of the day. Um, we've had a, a few technological issues. That's why we're late. But you know what? Technological issues don't phase you when you work on your emotional intelligence and your stress tolerance. Is that right, John? What do you that is true. That is it only true. affects you a little well, bit. Just a little bit, because we're human. Let me, uh, let me give you a little, um, a little intro. I'm going to personalize okay. this a bit. Um, so first of all, for those of you who don't know me, and you're, why don't you know me? You're in my Facebook group. That is just insane. I am Alan Cohen. I am the emotional intelligence and leadership coach for heart-centered, purpose-driven men who are up to big things in the world. We need you guys now more than ever um, in, these, in these crazy times. Um, I have the pleasure of, um, of introducing John. And John, is it Schinnerer? Is that how you say yes. your last Correct. name? Awesome. It's a tough so, one. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, uh, that's why I always like to check. So John and I um, connected uh, over social media. And he's been um, engaged in the uh, emotion in, in the EQ Advantage group, and and I'm grateful for that. And I have to tell you, one of the things that really jumped out at me about John, uh, among his many many accomplishments, um, he's a doctor, which I think is very cool. He's a psychologist. Um, but what what even even excited me more was that he um, he was a consultant on the movie Inside Out, which is one of my like all-time favorite favorite movies the pixar movie which really um helps like break down emotions in a way that that even the youngest uh, the youngest person can understand and so uh so i salute you sir um for thank for you your contribution to that so um so dr john is the host of the evolved caveman and um and that's to help uh, assist men in uh, evolving to their potential um he's got a host of of, uh, of uh, certifications and degrees. He's um, got a PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley. Um, he's, as I said, he's active in our EQ group. He's spoken at organizations, including Stanford Medical School. Um, he's spoken to entrepreneurs around the globe, been featured in a ton of national media. And uh, his expertise ranges from high performance to stress management to positive psychology, anger management, Creating happy, 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 <laughs> thriving relationships. Happy. Um, he's recently recorded two mini courses on anger management and forgiveness for Simple Habit, and they've been listened to a hundred thousand times. Doctor John, a hundred thousand times. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the mic over to him. Um, is there anything important that the folks should know about you that I've left out? Um, in terms of your creds, your credentials? Uh, well, just one of the things that I'm really proud of right now that we're working on is a, we did a worldwide global summit that's virtual and free. And we interviewed 28 thought leaders in an attempt to teach people around the globe sort of the skills that we need to deal with this pandemic. And then later with uh, the protests, but it's, you can visit it at survivingtothriving.site. Nice. And it's and I think about 30 for you. Interviews. 33, 33 interviews. 33 interviews. Oh. I think you um you interviewed one of our 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 uh, one of our members, um, which was Michael O'Neill, I believe. That's right. Yeah, yeah. great. Oh, Michael O'Brien. Who the hell is Michael O'Brien? O'Neill? Yeah, Michael shift. O'Brien. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> yeah, shift. Uh, and in the Peloton. Yeah, Peloton. Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. He is amazing. Well, you both are amazing. So, so we're so we're going to talk about a bunch of a bunch of important topics. We we um we we want to make it relevant to what's going on today. But um but uh, you know, as sort of a lead in, maybe we could just talk a little bit about man box culture and and why it's important for us to understand that. And um, that's that's a really cool concept. Sure. I I started out with anger management and then got into sort of executive coaching after about 10 years and realized pretty quickly that a lot of the men that I was dealing with 
were quite successful in the business world, but their biggest point of pain was at home with their loved ones, primarily their spouse. And that forced me to kind of look at this idea of masculinity, which led to the man box culture. And the man box culture is all about how we as men are socialized. And I, I haven't found a country that has an exception to this, but it, it may be out there. But the idea is that we learn as little boys, starting at maybe three, four, or five years old, these certain rules about what a man is and what he does. And there are rules that might they might come from your dad, but not necessarily. They might come from peers and friends and acquaintances. They definitely come from social media, movies, TV. Um, they might come from a sports coach. Uh, they could come from a teacher. But they're the rules that we kind of infer, such as men are invulnerable, men are self-reliant, men are dominant, men are aggressive, men don't feel, men don't show their emotions, um, men don't ask for help, things like that. And, you know, it's it, some, there's some good in there and there's some things that I would like, that I'm trying to be aware of so that I can titrate or kind of modify them, turn the volume down on them a little bit. Um, just to give you an example, like self-reliance, and I, I think of each of these things on a one to 10 scale. So from one, I'm not self-reliant at all to 10, I'm completely self-reliant and I don't ask anyone for anything. I've seen men that, um, you know, are so self-reliant, they'll pull their own teeth out in the garage with a pair of pliers. That's too self-reliant. That, that is destructive. Um, and, and so I, I think you want to look at each of these traits on that one to 10 scale and ask yourself, where do I want to be now? The, the other part of it, the part that's near and dear to my heart is how we are socialized emotionally. So what does that mean? So you get the man box and when you're growing up, if you show too much sadness or fear, someone will say something like, and forgive the slurs, but this is what we get. Someone will say something like, don't be such a bitch. Don't be a little girl or don't be a pussy. Mm -hmm. And that hurts. And so you jump back into the man box. You're like, ah, I don't like how that feels. I'm not going to show those emotions anymore. After some time, this might happen, you know, several mm -hmm. times. And then on the other side of the spectrum, if you show too much joy, romanticism, love, excitement, flamboyance, someone will say something like, stop being so gay, don't be a fag. And again, I apologize. And you learn really quickly how that hurts and you jump back in the man box. Right. So what are we left with as men that we can publicly display emotionally without fear of humiliation? We're left with three things. We've got stress because I can say I'm so stressed and Alan, you think, Oh wow, he must be busy and important. You know, that kind of thing. Right. You have lust. She, or he's so hot. I do her. Or the big one, you have anger, some degree of anger. So you've got frustration, irritation, annoyance, anger, rage. And a lot of our emotions get funneled through that anger lens. I mean, we know in men, depression comes out as irritability. I've seen anxiety come out as anger. I've seen embarrassment come out as anger. I've seen guilt come out as anger. And so the, the problem is that this is a way that we, we have to adapt in order to survive. So by the way, it's not our fault as men because we didn't ask to be socialized this way. We just were, it just kind of happens. But it is our responsibility to evolve past the man box and learn new ways of being, new ways of communicating and new ways of relating to ourselves. Yeah, I love that. I love, uh, I love that. And, 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 you know, I would throw like overwhelmed into, into the mix. I guess that's a form yeah. of stress, but I hear yeah. that a lot from from clients and and and, uh, and people in this community, are just you know, over overwhelmed, which is uh, you know, which we sometimes wear as like a a bag of a, a bag a badge <laughs> of courage, right? Right, bag of honor, right? Because you know, I'm so needed and I'm so pulled in so many different directions. I'm overwhelmed yeah. by it, which you know, it's it uh, you know, it can be kind of an ego thing. So where would you like to go from there? Because I can go sixteen different places. Yeah, no, I know, I know. So, so I, I want to talk about the um, kind of what we're, you know, and and you had an extra week to think about this. So you know, which was really about what's happening in the world right now, right around you know race issues, around around police aggression, or you know, and how to uh, uh, can you. Can you connect the dots for us a little bit in, in terms of man box culture and 
and and what role that plays in some of the dis the disease that we're experiencing right now? Yeah, I've I've tried to think about this, and I don't have a clear cut answer because I haven't thought about this a whole lot. So I'm still trying to connect the dots. Yeah. So bear with me. Um, sure. But I, I think that in the man box culture, and you know, if you look at a lot of the violence that we've got out there, it's often white man on black man violence, but it's man on man. Rarely does it go female to man, female to female. Sure. Sometimes it'll go man to female, but you know it's mostly yeah. man on man. Which, right. you know, the the whole man box culture really um, rewards aggression and violence. And you know, I, I mean, think of you know for those listening out there, how many fights did you get in growing up? How much did you have to do that to survive? How much were you um, rewarded with kudos and? honor, I suppose, for those fights, assuming you won them. Um, because one of the ways you can climb up the hierarchy in a, a men's group, a guy's group of, of friends, is physical aggression, physical power, physical stature. And, and so we learn that one of the ways we we climb the hierarchy is with our fists or other yeah. instruments. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that there's always that hierarchy when we're growing up, right? Even within a group of two or three or five or 10, you know where you stand in the hierarchy. Yeah. You know if you're the coolest yeah. guy in the group or the most powerful guy. You know how much respect you have. You know exactly where you are. You know who's one up above you and who's one below. And so I, I yeah. think that dynamic does come into this because it's how we're raised. It's how we're socialized. The the other part that I've been thinking about is, um, I don't think that most of us. And I'll, I'll stick with men just because that's kind of my area. Um, yeah. I don't think that most men out there are very aware of what's going on in themselves internally, whether cognitively their thoughts or emotionally how they feel. And I think that we tend to go through life on autopilot, like an automaton, like a robot. And we just, we're habitual. We are creatures of habit. And so I think that we often are not aware of the thoughts that go through our heads and, and some are very insidious and quick. And so you could have thoughts about a judgment of someone from a different race and not even really be aware of it. And, and that kind of gets to the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. So, it, so it's like the, um, it's kind of a double whammy. Right. So you have like the unexpressed, yeah. like the unexpressed, emotionally repressed man. Um, maybe it's a triple whammy. All right. You've mm -hmm. got the jockeying for position, the, you know, and then you have like the unconscious bias. Right. Or, well, or the, the conscious of, bias. Yeah. The explicit and implicit bias or conscious and unconscious bias. And, and I think that really hurts us because even if we get to the point where we're aware of our conscious biases, which that's, iffy at this point. I, I don't think there's a, a large percentage of the people out there that are even aware of their conscious biases. Then you got to get to the unconscious biases that we have. Those are the biases we're not even aware that we have. And everyone has them. And it, it makes sense if you go back in time and you think of living with a tribe of people who looked like you. And you know, if if someone looks like me, same eye color, same hair color, well, when I had hair, same skin color, I would extend them more trust because they're part of my tribe. And then if someone comes over the plane who doesn't look anything like me, it's going to be harder to trust them because they're different. They're the other. And I think some of that has stayed in our DNA over millions of years. And so we still have this mistrust of groups that are other that don't look like us. And one of the best ways to get past that is exposure, exposure to other cultures, to other races. And I, I really, I wonder how much of the racism in people in the U.S., could be correlated with a lack of travel that's because you know i and and i here's a question I, I want everyone that's listening i want you to ask yourself so yeah. first of all if you're out in the real world you need to be social like you need to be saying hi you need to be engaging other people in an attempt to make them smile or just to connect with them so if you do that assuming you do that and you're in line at starbucks or pete's or your coffee place who do you talk to? Who are you willing to reach out to? Who are the strangers that you are willing to connect with? Because they'll fall into groups. Like, oh, I, I'm happy to talk to this black man behind me. I can talk to this Indian person behind me. But I thought about this question, honestly, and I was like, you know, I don't, I don't really reach out to Chinese people. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and so that was my dark, that was my black spot, right? That was my unconscious bias. And so as a result, I actually, when I got the chance to go to China, I jumped on it in an attempt uh -huh. to learn about their culture and learn about just the people. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I, I, you know, I, I've seen that on my own experience as a gay man, like where, you mm -hmm. know, we'll go all attend events with, with my spouse and like, and it's like all the gay men like seem to, they seem to cluster together. It, it, it's, it's, it's not even like a, it's not like I'm waving a flag, like, Hey, come yeah. over, you know, come over here to, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's like this sort of entrainment. It's the sort of, well, it, you know, that's gay art too, right? Forgive the, the yeah. slang, but yeah. that's your gay art. Yeah. And so you're like, Oh, there's other gay men. It's safe to hang out here. It's but safe. Part of my that's responsibility it. is to go over to that group and hang out with you. So I'm more comfortable right. with that group. Right. I love that. No, it, it, it's really about like, it's putting some intention around around that now my spouse he like he'll like seek out people who he just thinks are interesting or different like that's you know and some of that has rubbed off on me but i yeah. tend to, i'll tend to to go to to what's comfortable but that's not necessarily how will affect change um yeah. in uh, you know in this in this moment of time so i love i, I love what you're what you're saying all right so you yeah, got go ahead um, no, I'm, I'm, I, I was, one of the things I was going to describe is there's a, I'm not a big fan of comparative psychology, but that's where you use animals to kind of infer, infer human behavior and how we think. Mm -hmm. But there was a great study on this very topic where they had two rats of different, I think different species is the right word. So there was like a white rat and then a rat that was half white, half gray. And they had this cage with a tube in the middle and you could only get out of the tube if someone on the outside or a rat on the outside pressed a lever that released the gate and would let the rat out. And so they put the white and gray rat in the tube. So he's trapped in the tube and they put a white rat in there and the white rat just walked around the tube, kind of looked at him in the tube and didn't do anything. Hmm. Then they did the same experiment with two white rats, same species. The white rat on the outside walks around the tube, realizes that his friend is stuck in the tube and hits the lever and lets him out. So the the rat that's perceived as different or other, he doesn't extend a hand to help. So right. what they did then was pretty interesting. They put these two different rats in the same cage for a week so that they could get to know each other, so to speak. Then they did the experiment again. Then the white rat whack, walked around twice, hit the lever, let him out. And I, I think that's a great metaphor for dealing with race. I love it. I love it. I, I have so many different different thoughts. So there's this popular culture reference. Last night I was watching this um, Steve Carell, this new TV series. Have you seen it about space? Uh, space uh, Force? Yeah. Space yeah. No, Force. I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to it. And here's this guy who's like runs the Space Force and he's completely repressed. He's like completely repressed, but he's got to go on like a space uh, mission simulation. And which means also that he has to be like alone, like alone with his thoughts and his emotions. And then he also has to, he has to integrate with these, like with these other people on the mission who are different from him. Yeah. And, and everybody, everybody who's not in this experiment, they're like, oh my God, he's going to freaking like his head's going to explode. Cause here's a guy who was like, never had to deal with emotions at all. Um, and he also, it, because he was in these close quarters, he he was forced to get to know these other mm -hmm. people, and by the end, well, he's like hugging you know, them. A, and, you know, there's a crazy. documentary called The Dama <laughs> Brothers, where they took ten men in a maximum security prison down in Georgia, and these men had committed horrific crimes, and they were going to do a vipassana meditation, a ten day silent retreat with these ten men. So they prepped them, they taught them how to do it, and then they filmed them before going into the ten days. And these guys were shitting their pants. They were really afraid because they were saying that my whole life I've run away from what's in here. I don't want to face what's in here. What's in here is terrifying. And I don't want to have to face my past and the things that I've done. And I, I think that's really true for all men that we try to do, 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 do in an effort to run away from our internal landscape. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think since we're both, we're both, in, it, it very interested in emotional intelligence and and and, and what that means. So what, you know, what do you think are the the harder emotions for men to access? 
I have a theory about it, but I'd to love to access, hear access to get in touch with, get in touch with, or to deal with. Yeah. How about both? Um, because I think the one that's hardest to get in touch with for men, uh, I would say, is sadness um, and all its variations. Um, and the one that's hardest to deal with, I would say, is shame. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Why do you think that is? Uh, because I think it's part of the way that we're socialized. I think the sadness piece is, you know, boys don't cry, men don't cry, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. Uh, off and um, we just were shamed for crying. Yeah. And it's embarrassing to us and we freaking hate to be embarrassed. I think there's a lot that drives us that is an attempt to avoid being embarrassed. Yeah. Um, and, and shame, I think, can be the master emotion. Shame is so powerful that it just outmuscles everything else. Um, and shame is when you feel I am all bad as opposed to guilt, which is I've done something bad. Um, and that's a big difference. And, and I think a lot of us were ashamed as kids. You know, you think of the finger wagging parent, um, shame on you. And I think so, those are some of the strongest messages we get as a young person. Yeah. What? Uh, so what do you think? I, and I hear this a lot from clients and, and, and I, I hear it from um, prospects. So, you know, uh, uh, what what do you think is the benefit to uh, to being more in touch with that the spectrum of emotions? All right. I think the biggest one is. It is the primary pathway to happiness that happiness is fundamentally an emotional experience i think all the 7.5 billion people on this planet are somehow or another shooting for happiness that's the ultimate goal we go about it in different ways wealth power fame money but a lot of those paths aren't really going to get you there um, we think they are that's the story we're told but i think that a big part of happiness is learning to serve others um, i think that Relationships we know are a big part of happiness. So you have to learn how to be better in relationship, which a big part of that's communication, as you know. Um, and so I, I think it's really um, a large part of his empathy. So knowing, I want to know what you feel. I want to know how you feel so I can best serve you. Um, and part of that's cognitive empathy, part of it's emotional empathy. Um, so yeah, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I well, I think I think that's spot on. So... I, you know, I talk a lot to guys in this group about my belief that that most of the things that we want in our life um, that we're not getting um, or that we are getting um, I have something to do with our, our connectedness to some aspect of our emotional intelligence. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I, I've seen over and over again is you know, basically we're asking people and myself and yourself to open up your heart and to be vulnerable and to feel what other people are feeling. But then also, I think we need some ways to protect ourselves from that. But the the problem that I see is, you know, you, you open up your heart, you get in a relationship, whether it's with a friend or, you know, a, a romantic partner, and we get hurt. We get disappointed. We get our heart stepped on. We get betrayed, whatever it is. And then we we retract and we withdraw and we cover up. And I think that's a normal process. I think the goal is to shorten the amount of time that you spend right. in your armor, in your man cave, right. and to get out there and to try it again. I think that's the whole process of life. And I think one of the big ones is not allowing the hurt to disconnect you from connection, from life, yeah. from others. Right. So, so really it's, 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 it's like we're, we protect ourselves from being hurt mm -hmm. um, by keeping people at an arm's length, but then we feel, we feel loneliness and separation. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's really on us because we've yeah. gotten the very thing that we said that we didn't want. And that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's it's difficult. It's hard. It's painful at times. And yet there's no other way because for a happy, thriving, fulfilling life, we need connection. We need relationships. We need emotional awareness and emotional literacy because yeah. part of the problem I see with most of the men is 
they don't even recognize a positive emotion when it hits them square in the face. Right. And if you don't recognize them, you can't be aware of them. You can't savor them. You can't catch them. And that's a, another right. big piece of happiness. Right. So, so I have, um, uh, okay, this is a question that's not on the list, but, but you are the expert, okay. so I'm going to ask you. So, so right now, like in this moment in time, I certainly know that I am aware of a million emotions coming through me on a daily basis, sometimes like within a, like, like within a nanosecond, what, mm -hmm. you know, one turns into another, turns into another. And so yeah. if somebody asks me how I'm feeling, I, I'm a lot of times I'm like, I actually, I don't know because it's like, it's gone from shame and guilt and despair to possibility to those aren't all emotions that I'm labeling. Yeah. Right. But, but would you say that for the most part, there's a predominant emotion that people are experiencing in a, in a moment or in a, a series of moments and the others are just um, more like, kind of like, like, um, the onion sort of, you know, just kind of peeling off a little bit. Well, I guess I, I have two answers to that. I mean, neuroscience has shown that we each have one signature emotion and that's something they got right in inside out. So if you look at the, the control panel, in someone's brain or mind, um, it, it varies who's in charge of the control panel, who's at the center spot. So for Riley, it, the 13 year old girl, it was happiness. And then I think it shifts to sadness, but there's some confusion as she goes through puberty. Um, for the, the mom, it's sadness. For the dad, it's anger. For the cat, it's nothing. There's no one at the controls, which is funny. But um, <laughs> but I, I think that, that there's truth to that. And that's been shown that we have a signature or primary emotion that is our responsibility to find ways to deal with and get to the next one. I, I think that's part of our terms yeah. of so I, evolution, right? That, you know, yeah. I think for me, I went through sadness first and then fear slash anxiety and then right. anger. And so I've tried to evolve through all those. I still get angry. I still get anxious. I still get sad, but they're not my primary emotions anymore. So that's one answer. The other answer is, yeah, I, I think that we have kind of this, um, like a net that water is passing through and that water is a, a mixture of a myriad of emotion. And so it, it, it is changing kind of constantly. And the other thing that comes to mind is, you know, you talk about complex emotions like guilt or shame or right. melancholy um, or contempt. Men actually take much longer than women to recognize what they're feeling. They might take hours right. to, and, and, and I've done that where I'm like, what the hell was I feeling? Like, I don't know. And you have to kind of think about it and sit on it before you go, oh, maybe it was contempt. Yeah. Um, whereas women are much faster at that. Yeah. Which, yeah, no, I think. Arguing. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's it's um, you you had touched on something earlier, but but I know for me that like, you know, when strong emotions come up, um, especially the strong strong negative emotions, I'll do pretty much anything I can to not have to experience them. So you know, so I will I will act, I will do, I will. I, I'll involve myself with something unimportant. I'll do what, yeah. but ultimately like that, it, it, it comes out in some, in some way, shape or form. And, um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you have any sort of any tips or any hacks like, you know, to, uh, for people to, to get more present with the emotion that they're, uh, that they're experiencing. Yeah. I, I don't know about hacks because I, I think, you know, I, the the description of mindfulness comes up right where right. you know you allow whatever's arising to arise without judgment and i think it's often the judgment of what we're feeling that really puts us in a snit right. so for instance i'm feeling sad i don't want to feel sad i feel shame about feeling sad i feel guilty about feeling sad i'm angry at myself for feeling sad so you get in this negative emotional spiral right. Um, and I think, you know, most of the men and, and myself some years ago are the primary strategy. The first strategy that we try in life is hold it at arm's length. Like, I'm not going to feel sadness. I don't want to feel this. So I'm just going to resist it. And I think a far better strategy is to turn towards it and welcome it and accept it and be curious about it. Huh. Seems like I'm feeling sad right now. Like, I wonder what that's about. Yeah. And right now there's a shit ton of things to feel sad about or sure. angry or stressed. Um, 
And so, I, you know, I love what you just said, John, the, 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 also the judgment, the judgment yeah. around the feeling, you know, cause, cause I've heard from clients, I've heard from people. It's like, I don't like, I'm feeling guilty actually that I'm experiencing happiness and joy right now. Like how can yeah, I, yeah, how, isn't that a funny one? how can I, and I, and as a Jewish person, you know, this is something we reflect on at the, on the <laughs> yeah. high holidays, I right? I like, feel happy. Right. Well, how, can, what right do I have? How yeah. can I feel joy when so many others are suffering? Like, and, and, and I, and, and I know that not feeling. to feel joy. Right. You know what I mean? Like, why shouldn't you feel joy? Who are you not to feel it? Who are you not to let your light shine? Right. Like, am because I only, when, when can I feel, only show, share joy that, when everybody You know, that Marianne Williamson it. quote, because by mm -hmm. you demonstrating happiness or contentment or joy or love, it gets, it gives other people around you permission to feel the same. Yeah. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, I think, is, ha um, and this takes some work in communication, but having loved ones around you that can accept your emotions as they are. Let me, I'll tell you a quick story. So yeah. um, when I first started dating my fiance, and this was, I don't know, we'd been going out maybe three months. So after work, I went over to her house. We had dinner. I was a little out of sorts. I was kind of tired and stressed and maybe a little irritable. And so at the end of the night, I'm going, I'm leaving to go home. And I said, you know, hey, sweetheart, like, I'm, I'm sorry that I was a little out of sorts. And, you know, I was just, you know, kind of tired and stressed from work. And she looks at me and she says, listen, my job is to accept all of you, the good and the bad. So don't even worry about it. And my jaw kind of hit the floor. No one had ever given me permission to feel what I was wow. feeling without judgment. Wow. And so that's, it's really powerful to, to allow your loved ones, the, the room and the space to feel whatever it is they're feeling. Yeah. Without, without feeling the need to fix them. Right. Right. That's, and, you know, and we I think men that's really challenging. Want to fix. Yeah. Because I, we don't I'll post what, in the comments. Go ahead, John. Sorry. So I was going to say one of the things I'll teach my men is, you know, if your wife or spouse or girlfriend or husband is venting to you, um, to ask them, you know, it seems like you're upset about something that happened at work and I want to support you the best I can. Let me ask you a quick question. Do you want me to just listen? Do you want me to try and fix it? Or do you want to hug? And most of the times I think they'll say, I just want you to listen. But then what I've discovered is we men have a really difficult time just listening because I think we are empathetic and we're picking up our loved one's distress, pain, anger, sadness, whatever it is. And we don't like that. We're not, we, we know, we've never been taught to sit with that discomfort and not do. And so then not that anxiety or distress comes up and we try and fix it again. So yeah. to the men out there listening, just be aware that that's the dynamic and just breathe. And, you know, imagine breathing out your discomfort while you're listening. And it takes practice. But I that's love a what, common I love dynamic. You, yeah. I love that you offered like the menu. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what do you need? Like, I'm trying to make need, it easy. You know, yeah. <laughs> Call me. Do you need to, you know, do you want to brainstorm this? Do you want me to yeah. tell you what I would do? Do you want to hug? Do you want to pick? Do you want me to just, you want to, right. Do you want me to just it? shut the F up? Bro? <laughs> yeah. And it's well, hard. I'll post, it is hard. It, it is. And it's exactly what you said that like, it's like, like we're not comfortable with the struggle, but, it, yeah. but it, 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 you know, and we don't want to see our partners, our clients, or, you know, we don't want to see them struggle, but sometimes it's more about like our discomfort, because mm -hmm. it's like bringing up stuff in ourselves or yeah. like a feeling of helplessness, like that, you know, that we need to have the answer for them. Well, and that, I mean, there's probably judgment in there. I should be able to fix this. Right. I right. should be able to help my loved one. Have you ever seen the, um, it's not about the nail video. Yeah. 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 With the nail right here. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give That's it away. Hilarious. I'll post it. I'll post it in the comments later. Okay. So, so I'm so like John. So like I'm a total fanboy of you. Um, <laughs> you know, I hope that's that's clear. But you know, so so the Pixar. I want to talk about Inside Out. Yeah. All right. So I, you know, so I'm wondering, like, well, if you could just describe a little bit about what that experience was like, and also like, what do you like? What what do you would you think? Why do you think men should see it? Right? Oh man, I think everyone should see it. I, I'm yeah. It's one of the things that I'm most proud about in my career in the sense that, and I just had a tiny hand in it, 
but those guys are brilliant at Pixar. And I think what they did is they gave permission to a generation of kids to be curious about what's going on in their head. They gave them languaging. They gave them permission to talk about it and to not feel that they were crazy because maybe they have different voices in their heads or yeah. different age versions of yourself in your head. Cause all that's normal to me. And, yeah. you know, to be able to speak about that stuff without shame or embarrassment is huge. And so in terms of, you know, the experience, um, I, I think at the time I had a, a pretty big anger management site. I had done an online anger management course and they found me through that. And I remember getting this call and they said, uh, can you talk to a producer here at Pixar? I'm like, what? I was like, well, yeah, sure. And I thought maybe he was stressed or depressed or angry. I don't know. And he gets on and he says, hey, this is Jonas Rivera. Uh, I made this movie called Up. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's a great movie too. yeah, I, yeah right. I have four kids. I, I think I own it. And, uh, uh, you know, I knew damn well I owned it. I was trying to be cool. And he's like, oh, great. He's like, well, me and Pete Doctor, Pete directed up, we're working on a new project. And we were wondering if you'd come down and pick some ideas and brainstorm with us. Yeah, I think I can fit that in my calendar. <laughs> and so I I went to Pixar and, you know, you go in and you get this. I, I was geeking out about the sticker, right? The sticker had aliens from Toy Story that said, ooh, <laughs> Uh, was it a stranger from the outside? And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And so I walk in and there's a big building on the right, which has all these Pixar figures that are like six to eight feet tall. And I'm like, I want to go in there. That looks fun. But I was going to a more serious building. I was going to the Brooklyn yeah. building. And it was so right. serious. I got stopped on the way by a security guard because most people go to that building. And he's like, excuse right. me, sir, you know, do you know, do you know where you're going? I'm like, yeah, I've got an appointment in the Brooklyn building. He's like, oh, okay, fine. And so we went there, I, or I went there, I was met by a executive assistant who brought me in, brought me upstairs past a sign that said producers only past this point. And it was like, the offices are so cool because everyone's got their toy collection, you know, so they're pop figures or action figures right. or cars. And it's just, right. it's awesome. Right. And so, you know, went into a meeting room. There was concept art for the film. Um, at that time, I didn't really get discussed. Discussed was more like a big nose that was turned up. I, I get what they were doing, but it didn't it didn't work. And so they had, right. you know, gave me feedback on that. And then we just sat. I sat with, you know, their top 12 people on the team and taught them about anger for a day. Um, nice. And these guys are brilliant. They knew more about emotions than most psychologists at that point wow. in time. It was nuts. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, they were like, yeah, they were talking about the circumflex of emotion. I'm like, wow, you you know about that? Like, that's impressive. Um, so, yeah, consulted with them for a day, and then uh, that was about it. Then, you know, the movie came out, got to see the the movie at Pixar, and um, it, it was really a blast just because the people are so bright and so curious. That, I mean, they did the same foundational research for um, Finding Nemo. Like they had fish yeah. experts come in and teach them about how Amazing. fish swim, what they look like. And yeah. it's it's pretty wild. I think I'm going to make it required viewing for all of my uh, EQ group members. It's, it's a good uh, one, yeah. It's so, so powerful. Right, and yeah. it's, it doesn't talk down to you. It sort of, mm -mm. It, it, um, it, you know, it, it, it normalizes... Uh, the experience of of emotion, yeah. and and I think that you know you were just talking about it's like making you know kids like kids feel more empowered to have the emotions that they're having and not feel shame. But I think as as men, yeah. I think because we're not talking about what's going on, we can start feeling crazy, like we're the only one who's feeling that way. Which mm -hmm. I think is also kind of you know is kind of hubris. <laughs> yeah. Like I yeah. am the only yeah. person in the world who's experiencing shame because I'm not filling this program or I'm not booking this talk or I didn't hit my my financial goal this year. Like, but we're not talking about it, and nobody's talking about it. So we all think that everybody's crushing it because yeah. social media is telling us everybody's crushing it. Right? Well, yeah, and the, the comparisons that we make in our own head are killing us. Because we always compare ourselves with someone that's doing better than ourselves in some way. Bigger biceps, cuter girlfriend, 
a better car, better house, making more money in sales, whatever it is. Um, but they right. make it, those comparisons make us feel less than. All right. Yeah, which is not a fun place to, not a fun mm -hmm. place to be. So, so we have a few minutes left, and and I always ask my guests this question: is you know, what's the question that you wish that I would ask you? And uh, and, and so let's ask that question and have you answer it. Okay, always a great question. I ask it myself, and I'm trying to think of um, what we didn't yeah, cover. What's, yeah, what's what's important? What's the message that's important for you to get out into the world right now? What's the thing that you want people to know about? You know, I think one of the I will check out the Evolved Caveman podcast, but I, I think one of the things that really um, the the framework that I like right now is you know, in pursuit of happiness, that happiness is all about relationships. So there's four areas of relationship to look at. The first one is relationship to yourself. So we've got to figure out what's going on inside in terms of thoughts, feelings, physiology in our body, because emotions are mostly embodied. Um, the second one is relationship to others. So how you relate to others, primarily, you know, your loved ones, but it, it extends to the world. And, you know, th that really gets to core beliefs. And I think, you know, I talk to a lot uh, with clients about core beliefs in the sense of, you know, what do you think about people in general? Do you think people are mostly trustworthy? Do you think they're mostly kind? Do you think they have good intentions? Are they honest? And those core beliefs can really impact how you move through the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Because most people I've met don't have positive core beliefs about others. Right. They tend to think they're, they're cynical and skeptical. Right. I think most people are dishonest. Most people are assholes. Most people, you know, will take you if you give them the chance. And just having that one core belief about people are generally bad or dishonest severely impacts your emotional, the emotional quality of your life as you move through the day. And just as an example, you know, think of interacting with the cashier at the, at the at Safeway at the supermarket. So if you think people are bad, you're going to be quiet as you move through the, the checkout line. You don't interact with anyone. You just kind of stay silent. You're sullen. You're withdrawn. Nobody wins. You just kind of walk away with the same lousy emotional quality. Hmm. Whereas if you think people are generally good and kind and honest, then when you walk through the, the checkout line, you interact with the cashier. You make a point of, I'm going to make this the best interaction of his day. You both walk away with a smile because you've connected over some silly sentence and you both win. So that's kind of relating to others. The other one is relationship to work. So I think we need work that we find meaningful and purposeful. And it doesn't matter what it is, you can find meaning in it. Um, and I don't have time to get into it, but there's a study on janitors where if the janitor finds his work meaningful in a hospital, they have all these health benefits, as opposed to another janitor, which just thinks it's a nine to five job, I get paid 20 bucks an hour. Um, and the last one is relationship to something larger than yourself. Uh, I think, you know, you mentioned hubris, and I think that yeah. when we think it's all about us, that's problematic. Um, yes. So having a relationship yeah. to a mission, a purpose, some sort of volunteering or a higher power. Yeah, I, I'm, I love everything that you've just shared. And, and you know, so um, just pick up on the last point. So social responsibility um, and, and an emotional connection to something greater than, than ourselves mm -hmm. is a core aspect of emotional intelligence. The, this is a, a great moment for you fellows to to reconnect with what that purpose is for you. What is that greater calling? What is that greater good? Um, and and not uh, not um, put put that to the side because the world seems to be going crazy right now. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the time to double down on your purpose because the world is going crazy right now. Right. You know, the the world needs men to step up and lead. And to not um, to not allow yourself to be derailed right now because it's hard. It's actually it is the you know do it because it is hard and because because you're needed. So thanks for yeah for reminding us, Ellen. Please. So I, I mean I really like the idea of just the men out there be aware of or women be aware of your definition of in group and out group. Because a lot of the trouble out there right now is because of our definition of in-group. So if I think of my in-group as white people, there's a problem there. If I think of my in-group as humanity, much better in-group. So, you know, consider your in-groups and out-groups, Republicans, Democrats, humans, animals, um, whatever it is. Um, but I, I really like if you can expand your in-group to include all of humanity, we're all going to be better off. 
I love that. I love that. Um, before we close, um, tell us where where everybody can get in touch with you or learn more about you. Okay, uh, guide to self.com is one site. Uh, the evolved caveman.com is one site. There you can find out about the podcast. Um, the other one right now that we're pushing out there for another couple weeks is surviving to thriving.site, S I T E. Love it. Um, so, fellas, um, we're kind of in the closing, the closing mile for the EQ Advantage group coaching program where we're going to help you crush your goals, but we're going to do it through an EQ lens. Um, Cause as I said earlier to John on this call, I think that, that your connection to your own emotional intelligence is definitely going to help you mm -hmm. empower your goals. Um, so we'll put the, all the links below. John, thank you so much for carving out some time in your very busy schedule to to have another conversation with Alan Cohen. So Absolutely, my pleasure. Always love talking to you. Great. Thanks so much.